As Andy said, I've, I've had a, a contact with him uh, for a year or so, but uh, before that I, I'd uh, had dealings with Tim Dayton, who some of you will, uh, will know, who lives in Dent and who trains uh, for uh, Institute for Outdoor Learning. And um, we have some land at uh, Dent, um, my wife and I, uh, which um, we uh, uh, let the outdoor learning people use to, um, to do some training on. And we have big family camps there. Uh, during the music festival period at Dent, so it's, uh, we've got a resource which I'll refer back to later on. So, um, I'm fascinated by this whole area. Uh, I, I stumbled on it, uh, the sector, by chance with, because of Tim Dayton. But, um, in a sense, my interest in this whole area of outdoor activity is, is in the blood. Um, my mother was a cub mistress and my father was a scoutmaster, and that's how they met. Um, and, uh, you know, in the... Um, 19, early 1930s, uh, and uh, for their honeymoon, they cycled on a tandem uh, from Liverpool down to the West Country, staying in youth hostels. So, uh, interesting concept for a for a honeymoon, um, which is which is what they what they did. Uh, and of course, I, I was in the scouts myself, as most of the family have been in the guides and so on. But I, I want to say a bit more about that a bit later on. Um, first, a bit about public health. Um, the definition which um, uh, is most commonly quoted uh, about public health these days is, uh, comes from Charles Winslow, who was the founder of Yale School of Public Health in about 1916. And uh, Winslow described public health as the um, science and art of protecting and improving health and treating disease through the organized efforts of society. Not about, not about hospitals and doctors and nurses, but the organized efforts of society to protect and improve health and treat disease. So it's very, a whole system is very in inclusive. Um, on the other hand, um, if you go back to William Morris, who was writing um, towards the end of the 19th century, uh, William Morris's definition uh, is uh, very interesting. 1884, William Morris said, at least I know this, that if a person is overworked in any degree, they cannot enjoy the sort of health I'm speaking of, nor if they are continually chained to one dull round of mechanical work with no hope at the other end of it, nor if they live in continual sordid anxiety of their livelihood, nor if they are ill-housed, nor if they are deprived of all enjoyment of the natural beauty of the world, nor if they have no amusement to quicken the flow of their spirits from time to time. All these things, which touch more or less directly on their bodily condition, are born of the claim I make to living good health. So here we have a very clear, holistic uh, concept, and I hope you can begin to see how uh, what you're all doing uh, connects to uh, the way I think about public health. I'm going to use the rest of the time uh, to uh, go on a, a sort of a perambulation, really, but come back to some key, key issues. One of the most influential figures in public health uh, in the post-war period has been a man called Archie Cochrane, long since dead, but some of you will have heard of the Cochrane collaborations, which are about evidence-based health care. Archie was a rather delightful, eccentric bachelor who lived in South Wales and drove a vintage Rolls Royce and had a penchant for uh, expensive claret. But he, he did the, some of the best um, work that showed the relationship of the dust diseases uh, in the coal miners in the, in the valleys. Um, he wrote a little book um, towards the end of his career, uh, which, which led to the uh, evidence-based medicine movement, and it, it was called effectiveness and efficiency, random reflections on the NHS. It's only about 80 pages, but it was a very influential book. Um, and at the beginning of that, Archie uh, talks about meeting a crematorium worker. Uh, and uh, the crematorium worker said to him how amazed he always was by how much went in and how little came out. And Archie said to him, have you ever thought of getting a job in the NHS? <laughs> 
which is currently running is about 110 billion pounds a year, and we still don't know what impact that investment has on the population's health. Uh, we, we know that we have measures of uh, activity, uh, but we don't have measures of outcome. We have measures of output, but we don't have measures of outcome. We don't know what the effect is. Uh, but what I was taking from my keynote here is the random reflections on public health and the outdoor sector. So if you'll bear with me. Um, the changing nature of health since, uh, since uh, um, uh, the, the days of, um, uh, of William Morris, uh, you know, we're all familiar with this amazing phenomenon of the very large numbers of people who are now living into their 80s and 90s. I mean, it only began in the 1970s, really. Very large numbers of people now living into their 80s and 90s. We, we all grew up, on, those of us who are old enough, uh, with the concept of you know, three score years and 10. Uh, but the expectation of life continues to increase. Um, each decade, it's increasing by a couple of years, at least. Um, but there are huge variations in that, massive differences in life expectancy between different social groups and different social areas. 20 years difference uh, in, the, in Cumbria, where I was working uh, last, um, 20 years difference between some wards and other wards in life expectancy. Um, massive difference in people's uh, well-being uh, between areas and in, the, in terms of their long-term conditions. Um, you know, the definition of, um, of an optimist is someone who hasn't heard the bad news yet, but we're all of us going to finish up with long-term conditions um, of one kind or another. Some of us in this room already will have them. I have uh, raised cholesterol, I've got controlled blood pressure, I've got type 2 diabetes. Uh, you know, uh, these are things which, um, you know, will impact on all of us to a greater or lesser extent, but one of the things uh, that we, we learn is that, um, is that um, death is inevitable, but premature death, a lot of it, is avoidable. Um, and a lot of long-term conditions are avoidable. Um, and it brings us to really try to understand how physical and mental health interact uh, towards well-being and um, in terms of, uh, of um, WHO, uh, dying young as old as possible. You know, keeping fit till you fall off the perch. Uh, and how do you um, create those conditions for people uh, to uh, keep fit till they fall off the perch? So uh, I think we have to uh, recognize um, that, that uh, the task that faces us is to create conditions and environments that support healthy, healthy living. Um, prevention and participation uh, are key words in the modern public health uh, lexicon. I mean, prevention always has been. But historically, public health was very paternalistic, it was very top-down, it was very much based on legislation uh, and enforcement about environmental conditions and so on. Today it's much more complex. We have to take people with us on a journey uh, where they are able to play their own part in maintaining their own health. Um, and I would argue that your sector, uh, as rich as it is, um, has a key part potentially to, to play in that. I mean, uh, the, the more I become aware of your sector, uh, the richer I see it is and, the, and the, 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 the tentacles reach out into so many areas that impact on public health. Um, I had a, a phone call when I was I was regional director of public health for the Northwest for 13 years, and and they, they dragged me into the medical civil service when they abolished the regional health authorities. You know, so for for about 10 years I was a medical civil servant, which was an interesting position for someone like me to occupy. But um, I took a, a, a phone call uh, from um, da David Clark, who some of you will know, Lord David Clark. He, he was David Clark MP. Uh, South Shields uh, for many years, uh, and uh, Lord Clark of Windermere uh, began life as a forester and finished up uh, in the Lords uh, as chairman of the Forestry Commission, which was a beautiful piece of poetry. Uh, and he phoned me up uh, one day when I was regional director and he said, John, we've got several million acres uh, under, under wood and open space, 
and we think we've got a role to play in public health, but we don't know what it is. Can you come and talk to the board, please? Um, so I, I went to dinner with the board and we had a very good conversation. This is probably nearly 15 years ago now. Uh, but it led me ever since then to uh, reach out and make these connections. So I made connections uh, working in Cumbria, worked closely um, uh, with the Lake District National Park, um, with um, Richard Leaf, who some of you will know. It's like Lord Brain. You have to be a brain surgeon if your family name's Brain, don't you? If you, if you Leaf, you've got to be involved in outdoors stuff. There's your predestination. Um, so, uh, and um, we actually had a very good uh, meeting, and uh, one of the people who was there is here this morning, you know, he's indicating, uh, when, as a result of um, the discussion we had with Richard, uh, uh, my chief executive of the Faculty of Public Health, that I'm president of, uh, we were invited to the annual get-together of the chairman and chief execs of all the national parks uh, in Tembe uh, a few months ago to talk about what's the potential role of the national parks in public health. Let's think about that one as a strategic question. Uh, you know, uh, how, how pervasive uh, could the uh, contribution be uh, if there was a systematic approach to enabling people to participate in the national parks? One of the things I, I discovered when I was in Cumbria was I went to see the Outward Bound folk at Allswater um, for a chat. Um, one of the things I've always done in my life is cold call people and, and go and say, you know, I think we've probably got some things we should be doing together, but I don't know what they are. And it was, it was what Lord Clark taught me, really, I suppose. Um, I went to see the, see the Outward Bound at Allswater, and I was rather shocked to discover that such a high proportion of the young people who go on Outward Bound courses uh, in the Lake District are actually from the South East. Uh, and, um, and, and very often from independent schools in the South East. Um, and that the level of participation uh, among working class kids from West Cumbria in their own county, in the Outward Bound, is very low. Um, I, I was getting off the train yesterday at Oxenholm and there were a group of lads uh, with a youth worker um, looking a bit tired uh, with their rucksacks and um, uh, I went and had a, had a coffee, the, the rather nice artisan bread and coffee place at Oxford Home Station these days. Um, and I had a chat with them, and you know, asked them you know, what they were doing, where they'd been. They'd been camping and walking in the Lake District. And they were from London. And they were of different ethnic backgrounds. Um, and this was the first time. Uh, they'd been out into the countryside. There were boys of about 12, 13, 14, a group of about eight of them. Uh, I asked them how much they'd enjoyed it, and they said they had. I said, would you do it again? They said, yes. Um, so, you know, it's refreshing to see that, but when you realise the extent uh, of the deficit of access uh, that's there, we've got the huge mountain to climb if we want to facilitate uh, the universal access to these wonderful resources that we have. Um, well, while I was working in Cumbria, I mean, I, I got um, a couple of hobby horses. I normally get hobby horses, but the, the, the Cumbria hobby horses were basically, you know, ha having thought about the Outward Bound question, because um, I sent my own kids on Outward Bound when they were teenagers, you know. Um, when I thought about that, I thought, um, there are 5,000 births a year in Cumbria. 5,000. Um, you know, 5,000 is not a big number. Um, I, I, I'll come back to that in a minute, but I was, I was involved in a conference on looked after children some years ago. And looked after children have the most disastrous statistics and outcomes you could ever imagine in your life. I mean, most women in, in the sex industry have been uh, in care. Uh, most of the lads in Young Offenders Institutes have been in care. Uh, a high proportion of uh, young people who are, who've run away from home and living on the streets have been in care. We had a conference about them and we talked about an initiative that Bernardo's have, a very good initiative that Bernardo's have. But 
I, um, I asked somebody from one particular borough, I won't say what, which borough it was, uh, how many young people leave care each year? I think the answer was 34. Okay, 34. You scale that up. Scale that up by 140 boroughs across the country. You know, it's several thousand, it's probably 5,000. My mental arithmetic's quick enough for me. Um, a year leaving care. But if, at the borough level, 34. If we can't sort that out together, we shouldn't be drawing our salaries. You know, it, it requires a joined up approach to giving those young people who are among the most needy uh, in the country the sort of experience and rites of passage that will enable them to enter adult life with a fair chance of floating. And I would suggest, and I know that from the conference I attended in, um, in, in, uh, in the Lakes uh, last, uh, some months ago, that some of you are involved with that kind of work. I mean, that's, that's part, of, uh, part of your story. Um, so, uh, I came to the conclusion, to come back to my hobby horse, that all we need in Cumbria is 5,000 passions. Just one passion each. You know, by the time they leave school, you want each child to be passionate about something that's not going to get them into trouble and will help them make their way. Now, you are custodians of passions. You know, you are. You have a key role to play in facilitating access to passions of these young people. I also had this thought, one of my lads went out with a, with a girl years ago from Millfield and I discovered um, that at Millfield, which is like an expensive comprehensive school, um, that they have a very large number of um, after hours clubs, huge numbers of after hours clubs. I mean, you know, more than dozens different things. And I know from my own experience, because I have, um, I have a, a young child, as well as a grown up ones, um, who is at an independent school, the range of stuff that's available. And you go to a, a school in a disadvantaged inner city area or rural area or coastal area and you see what's on offer uh, after school. And, you know, it's just not fair. Um, so the challenge is, why can't the ones that have got all these clubs, the sailing and the climbing and the skiing and the, all the other stuff that's going on, why can't they twin up with the other ones and help them get cracking? Why can't we have some solidarity? Why can't we develop a way to make those connections, to release those resources for the ones that really need to have access to it? How do we create the pathways from the west coast of Cumbria, from your Barrow and your Workington and your Whitehaven and your Maryport, and how do we create those pathways for those kids who are stranded on that coastal strip with poor communications and poor aspirations to give them tasters and opportunities and access to the national park which is on their doorstep, the forestry estate which is on their doorstep, and all of the opportunities which are potentially there that would be life-changing. How do we create those opportunities? Now, I said this would be random reflections. And I know um, Andy said to me, he said, you know, these are outdoors types. They, uh, he said to me when I came, he said, they're outdoors types, you know. He said, you can't expect them to sit still for very long. I mean, they want to. He said, you've got to throw some questions at them once and get them to do something. Is it? I've been spending the last few weeks <coughs> with some very different kind of outdoors types, actually. Um, I've been involved uh, with selecting the NHS volunteers to go to Sierra Leone. Um, that's what I've been doing for a lot of the time for the last three weeks. I've been sat in Manchester or in London doing long telephone interviews with volunteers. We've had 700 people so far volunteered to go to Sierra Leone, doctors and nurses. Um, and they're remarkable people, you know. You can see, oh, yeah, I find it very moving.
these people are prepared to put themselves at risk for other people. They're very action oriented people. Doctors and nurses who like to get their hands dirty but keep them clean in that environment that they're going to. You know what I mean? Um, their CVs are amazing, these people. They've, they've done all kinds of really interesting things. They've not followed a, a linear career path at all, mostly. Uh, you know, they've not stayed close to the desk and never gone to sea in the hope of being ruler of the Queen's Navy. But they've actually uh, gone off, they've done VSO, they've gone and worked in development, they've worked in villages in India, they've done stuff, they haven't followed a, a straight career path, got all their badges, got all their certificates, got their special, they've got eclectic mixes of experience. But, and, um, and, they, and they've cut themselves forward. And they, you know, they would re really are impatient to get out there and get stuck in. Incredible. But, at the same time, to deal with the challenge um, of what's facing us in West Africa, we've got to have people who are sitting behind desks, thinking, planning, plotting, sorting out logistics. You know, the army are out there at the moment um, building field hospitals, uh, isolation units, and so on. But to get the laboratory capacity up to, up to scratch requires a lot of logistic thinking and planning. You know, you can't just send people off to be in risk uh, without doing all that stuff behind the scenes. At my age, um, and with my uh, atrophied clinical skills, uh, but with a lot of experience of dealing with people, um, the contribution I can make is to help to select the ones who, can, who who, who are going to go. So, I want to make an analogy here um, with, a, a, you know, a disaster response. Um, a long time ago, when the, when the situation blew up in, um, in, East, in the Horn of Africa, in Ethiopia, I went on a, a, a training course um, to, to be deployed. Um, but, uh, <coughs> I didn't go in the end because I had three children under five and it wasn't a popular idea domestically. Um, but I, I did um, a week's course in, in deployment for, for the camps there. And um, what I learned about that was that if you've got 12,000 women and children in a ref refugee camp in the Horn of Africa, uh, there are no men because men will be off fighting somewhere. Um, and you drop in a, 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 a humanitarian team, you don't immediately set up a, a field clinic and start treating sick babies. The first thing you do is a census of the people in the camp and, and, a, and a, an assessment of what skills they've got. You find out what resources you've got so that you can mobilize them. Because you'll have people who've got nursing skills, you'll have people who've got teaching skills, you'll have people who are good at organising the kids to play football and whatever. You'll have people who can, can do the, um, the, the mechanical work and the navvying and doing the sanitation and all the rest of it. So the first thing you do is you have to do, you have to do a census. Um, now, John McKnight, who I'm going to see next week actually, we're going to America early tomorrow morning, uh, it's half term, and I'm uh, going to go and see John. He's a, a guru, a mentor of mine. Um, he worked for 40 years uh, in Chicago, um, developing asset-based community development, known as ABCD Capitals. If you Google abcdinstitute.org, you'll find all this stuff. Um, abcinstitute.org. And John is, uh, he looks like an, uh, an Old Testament prophet, you see. Uh, he came from a family that were covenanters on the west coast of Scotland generations ago and turned up in the States. And they trained community organisers and, um, and he trained Obama as a community organiser uh, for three years. Uh, after, after he'd done his first degree, he trained as a community organiser. And one of the things John McKnight says, 
is you don't go to the shop till you've seen what you've got in your own backyard. You know? Asset-based community development. Map the assets. Now, we, we are asset-rich. Even in the most disadvantaged community, there are assets. Part of the problem, though, is that we have professionals who go in and don't build the capacity or build on the capacity that's already there. We, we uh, emasculate communities the way we work. We don't build on their strengths by mapping the assets in the first place and seeing how to get alongside them. And that's the philosophy behind asset-based community development. And so, if the challenge is for all our young people, and not just all our young people, because I haven't started to scratch the surface of the aging story, you know, 40% of widows depressed, 40% of widows depressed at home, lonely, isolated, um, how do we make it possible for people to have a quality of life and a participating life, even when they're beginning to get those multiple things that go wrong with you as you get older? Uh, and I would suggest that your sector has a lot to say and to offer about that agenda as well. So, we have to... How am I doing? Now, how, many, how much longer have we got? Ten, that's fine. Just need to try, try and calibrate. Um, so, um, so we need to, um, to map the assets. Okay? We need to map the assets. We also need to go strategic, you see. Um, and this is where Andy says, you know, move, people get don't talk to, you know, up in the air strategy. These are, these, these are hands-on folk, you know. Um, and, but somehow, if, we, if we're talking about how your sector evolves and matures and delivers to its, its uh, potential, then you need some strategic thinking in here as well. Um, and I don't know whether you want to interrupt it. Andy said to me, give them some questions and have a break, you see, but I don't know. I'll, I think I'll carry on talking. Do you want me to give you some questions and have a break, or should I talk for 10 minutes and leave you with some questions to think about? Should I carry on talking? Yeah, okay. Um, but I, I, what I want you to start thinking about, though, what I want you to start thinking about is what will this sector look like in 10 years' time? I want you to start thinking about what will this sector look like in 10 years' time? Um, so, you know, it's not a new sector. It's a sector that's been around a long time. Um, and um, I, I floated the concept uh, up in the Northwest when we were talking there, which I stole, you know, it, you shouldn't be in public health if you can't plagiarize, you know, it's very important to plagiarize. Part of the big problem in the world today is people don't do things if somebody else thought of it first, you know, it's not invented here, I'm not doing it, you know. Um, but my cousin, John Ashton, was the government's global ambassador for global warming until two years ago. And uh, John's got a much bigger brain on him than I have. I've just, you know, tried to make the most use of what I've got. He's got a big brain on him. But he, um, he came up with this thing, which he formed with other ex-diplomats from around the world. He was in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And he's a scientist. Um, called E3G. You Google that, E3G. Environment of the Third Generation, E3G. And so he talks about the first generation of environmentalism, second generation of environmentalism, and the third generation of environmentalism. And the third generation of environmentalism is about getting those things, the sustainability and all of that stuff, onto everybody's agenda. It's really permeating everybody else. So there's a real parallel. That's what we need to do in public health. But I think um, that's where I think we need to start thinking about uh, Outdoors sector, outdoors sector, third generation outdoors, third generation outdoors. What was first generation outdoors? First generation outdoors was Baden Powell. You know, it was my mother and father. 
growing up in the, in the 1910s and 1920s, becoming cup master, cup mistress and scout master, and doing all that stuff. That, that was first generation kind of stuff, uh, outdoors. And the, and the Ramblers, and the Youth Hospital Association, and all those things. That was the first generation of outdoor stuff. The second generation was the National Parks. Uh, the post-war settlement of uh, you know, building, building the structures and so on. And the twin objectives of the National Parks and um, the uh, uh, Forestry Commission, uh, I think we had that conversation, uh, you know, twin objectives. There's the heritage stuff, looking after it, keeping it nice, not letting people mess it up. Uh, but then there's the social uh, objective, uh, the social value, the participation, the enrichment of life. That's the health and well-being objective. Um, but I think we now need to be in this third generation of outdoors, which is what you are. You are it. You are the cohort that can really move this on uh, and make it meaningful um, to the whole population at whatever stage they are in the life cycle and help to make that integration which we so desperately need between mental health and physical health. Um, I went, I mean, who knows Winder? Winder. No, you don't know Winder. Winder is a, a hill. It's quite a, a serious hill. You know Winder. Yeah. You've run up it. Did you go to Sedmer School? No. no. <laughs> Winder is a serious hill next to Sedmer School, which they get to run up quite a lot. Um, and it's part of the Wilson Run, which has been going on at Sedmer School for over 100 years, which is a fell run. Uh, it's about 12 miles long, very, very severe run, which all the kids are expected to do at least once before they finish school uh, at the age of 18. Um, but Winder is... Um, I, I went up Winder on, uh, on sat uh, Saturday uh, with um, a friend and colleague of mine, Phil Batty, uh, who, who lives at the bottom of Winder. Um, it took about an hour or so to get up and about 10 minutes to get down. Um, and when you get to the top of Winder, you can go, because you can see right the way down, uh, past Blackpool, down to Merseyside, you can see all the way across the Lake District. It's one of the most fantastic views, um, you know, that there is really, in, in that sense. Um, but what um, we were talking about uh, there uh, is that Phil is the Vice President of the Faculty of Sports and exercise medicine of the Royal College of Physicians. It's a, so I'm, I'm the president of the Faculty of Public Health of the Royal College of Physicians. Phil's vice president of the Faculty of Sports and Exercise Medicine. But what we're talking about was he would really like them, and he seems to have quite a, a, a body of support behind the, the, the idea, to broaden their scope from being about sporting excellence and sporting injury. Uh, to mass participation. And there's always this tension, you know. Um, and, and I remember years ago, my three that have now long, long since grown up, going, if you, do you remember Sport for All? Sport for All? The 1970s or 80s, I guess. Anyway, it's quite a while ago. And um, we used to, I lived in Southampton at the time, we always used to go uh, to the baths of by. Um, by Winchester on a Sunday morning with the kids. And we arrived one Sunday morning with the kids to go swimming to find that we weren't allowed in that day because they were having a sport for all demonstration. <laughs> uh, and so there was always this, you know, this tension between, you know, putting all the resources into securing gold medals in the Olympics versus putting the money into ensuring that everybody takes part in something. And, uh, and, you know, and Phil uh, and I were talking about this as we went up Winder last Saturday because the objective is more people more active more often. You know, that's a public health objective. More people more active more often. It's simple, really. That's where we need to be. So, um, 
I've, I've said I, I'm going to draw to a close in a moment. Um, so the challenge is, um, how do you do the strategic thinking? How do you connect to where you can scale up all of this stuff that you're doing? Um, and so many of you just want to get on and do the thing you do and so on. But somebody needs to do the strategic thing. So you've got to connect at the top level, at the policy level, across government. You've got to connect at the, um, at the local administrative level, whether it's a county or a district or a city or whatever, or the borough or the parish or whatever, uh, as well as getting on and doing you know, the day job. So I recognize, you know, as I said, um, speaking with all these volunteers wanting to go to Sierra Leone, and you've got this tension between getting on doing and standing back and making sure the logistics are in place. You've got to do both. Um, we have, um, if you have um, an emergency, if you have a disaster or an emergency, and you convene, if the chief constable convenes a gold command, which is the way the, the words we use, the terminology, some of you will be familiar with that. I suspect some of you are involved in mountain rescue and so um, But, uh, you know, the gold command, they sit in a fancy room somewhere and just receive all the intelligence coming in and make high-level decisions uh, about what's going to happen and try to anticipate what's going to happen next. Uh, they've got to do the thinking. Uh, they've got to be in a position to really assess it. And that's, that's chaired by the chief constable, usually, with the heads of service, and, you know, from health and fire and rescue, and, you know, the other agencies. The silver guys, the silver level, are the ones who have to take away the instructions from that level to go and uh, make it happen. And the bronze are the frontline Joes and Josephines who are doing the stuff on the ground, you know, the ambulance men and women and so on, and the constables and so on and so on. And so I think that's a command and control structure in an emergency. But you could argue that the public health crisis that we face, uh, you know, of over 30% obesity, large uh, proportion of unfit population, costing a large proportion of the NHS budget for avoidable things, requires a command and control solution. It's not fashionable, command and control. But I think you need to um, be thinking strategically and silver and bronze to go forward. Finally, um, if you look at the natural history of businesses and enterprises, then um, they typically have, um, have a, a shape like, like a, a nest the wrong way around, you know? Uh, like that, see? And at the bottom, what you've got here is you've got a new business, and um, people can't uh, get enough of it, whatever it is, the product, uh, and um, you've got lots of smaller outfits, and everybody's happy to help each other out. Um, I'm just trying to think of, a, of an example. Um, it could be, uh, it could be people beginning to set up coffee bars or something like that. You know, that might be a good example. Um, and there might be a you know, lend guy in the next village some coffee beans when they run out. You know, where we help each other out. So, as it matures and you begin to get monopolisation and maturity of the market, people become less um, willing to help each other, and it, and it tends to get, um, you know, monopolised and shrunk and all of that. Now, I recognise in your sector you've probably got bits of different points on that, that you've probably already got some professionalisation and consolidation and so on in the sector. Um, but if, if you're going to grow uh, this sector, I'm always reluctant to use market words for social enterprises. But if you're going to grow the sector, then the collaboration uh, that you develop um, over the next three, five, ten years will make a huge difference uh, to your reach and your ability to impact on the nation's health and well-being. <laughs>